Hi guys, Zator here, and today I'm going to be going over mixing and mastering for Godzillionaire. Uh, this is an up-and-coming track from Nasty Geographic on their new album, Upsetting Heaven. And they really liked how I mixed this one, so I figured this would be a good example of how I approach different, uh, different elements, really. Uh, there's a lot of different elements here, as you can see by the mixer. It's got a lot going on here. Um, first, we have uh, bass in green. Uh, guitars in red, which I actually should rename. It's just the bus right there. Uh, orange is vocals. Uh, we have a couple of samples here in the middle. They're just random colors. And blue is drums. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into it. Um, the first two tracks, as you can see, we have color-coded green up at the top here. And those are our bass tracks. I'll let you hear the first one real quick. These are not bust in any way. They're just going out to the master. Uh, first one. So the first track is the primary bass track. Uh, a little bit more plucky, as you can see. And this is where I'm pulling most of the low end from. As you can see from the EQ here, I have the low end below 100 hertz boosted some and just a little bit of presence at 1 kilohertz to give that pluck a little bit more, more pluck. Um, and that goes into saturation. So we have EQ into saturation, which is, of course, messing up. There we go. Um, Tesla SE is just like a transformer type saturation. Really, really smooth and works great on bass or really anything I throw at it. So the dry track sounds like this. We'll add an EQ. That'll emphasize the low end and roll off some of the high end. We don't need so much of the string noise. And then we'll add in our saturation. We'll go ahead and throw in the compression, which I am using a Thrill Circuit VBL. This is a... It's... A limiter but it's kind of an old radio style limiter um, basically you just throw the gain up and throw the compressor up and it's gonna sound good really that's that's all but it, it does actually have some eq characteristics it mutes the high end above like five kilohertz if you really start driving it so a little bit of drive shapes the sound in a way that i find is very pleasant on bass um, it just works out really well and it, basically anywhere I use it, but bass specifically, this is one of my favorite plugins. And it also does add some uh, saturation through its amplification circuit. Next, we have the alternate bass, which does have some low end. I did low cut it, but I really wanted to avoid most of the phasing issues. So it's got more of an emphasis on the mid-range. Um, and that also gets uh, saturation uh, a fair bit more. Uh, saturating the mids, uh, I felt, was was the better option here. Uh, and that goes into Thrill Seeker LA, which is a LA 2A, I believe, emulation. Um, I wanted to preserve more of the dynamics than throwing a limiter on it. So I just kind of threw it into the LA 2A and... Uh, left it there, giving it about 5 dB of compression, maybe a little bit less. So real quick, I'll turn off the effects. And we get a nice tone out of that, and those two mixed together. Cutting that low end out of the second bass track really helped with making sure there weren't so many phasing issues. And even though the the second bass track I think could have could have worked as the primary bass, um, I'm adding enough compression on the first one that don't exactly need much more. So that's how I went about my, mixing and mastering the bass. It's the same the whole way through. Uh, what else do we got? Oh yeah, and just uh, I guess I would actually get to that later in the in the mastering stage, uh, but that would affect the the bass tone. There's some vinyl emulation going on in this section, as you can see from the automation clip, uh, but we'll get to that in the mastering section. 
Uh, next, we're going to look at this. Well, I have sample there. We, we'll come back to that. We'll go on to the guitars next. And I, I guess that's a guitar. It sounds kind of weird for a guitar, but I guess it technically would be. That's definitely a plug guitar. I'm not adding the reverb. That's just how it came to me. But we're EQing it. it. I just uh, rolled off the low end just to make sure that there wasn't anything there that could rumble or phase against anything else. And then cut above 10 kilohertz ish. It goes into a tube emulation. I have the EQ section turned off. It's more of a preamp emulation. It's a tube preamp emulation. Uh, but as you can see, I'm driving that up and I wanted to get some of that nice uh, tube sound. It's really subtle though, especially on this track. It comes through more on the louder parts. You can see it hits the right a little bit there. And um, I have the I have it turned on and set to vintage mode because I felt like that was more appropriate uh, for this guitar anyways. Uh, I haven't noticed a huge difference between vintage and modern, There's, but I think modern has more emphasis on the lower end while vintage is more, not lo-fi, but getting towards that in a bit more mid-present, but really it's kind of subtle. And then of course more compression. This is one of, this has quickly become one of my favorite compressors, uh, this LA-2A uh, emulation. Um, Really just throwing it on there just to give it a sound and a little bit of compression. There's not much needed, but it's on there just to level it out a little bit because these, this track is very dynamic as you can see. So having a little bit of compression helps out in the mixing stage. Uh, next guitar track doesn't do much until the very end here. Sounds pretty interesting though. I think that's a wah pedal. I don't know enough about guitar pedals, so I'm guessing that's what that is. Uh, that goes into uh, two EQs. The first one is just a notch. Right over here, there's that really harsh resonant frequency and putting that notch on there helps uh, helps get rid of that harshness um, and it, it brings out the rest of the sound as well as ra rather than just being a, a high frequency sine wave really uh, that goes into that same uh, preamp emulation that I was talking about uh, this time I have it set to vintage as well EQ section off and a lot more drive this time because this is a very quiet track though I'm overdriving it fair bit with the louder parts, but it works out okay in the quieter bits. And then the same compression. Uh, what's different about this one is I have the attack and release turned way down. Uh, it's not a plucky sound, so getting I can get away with the attack being low. Um, drives a fair bit up, and I have uh, the inner stage, which is something that was on a modified LA-2A, I believe. Um, but you turn on the transformer and then add a little bit of uh, stateful saturation. It's really, really subtle, but I felt like it would work in this case, especially with there being such a resonant frequency or so many resonant frequencies everywhere. Helps smooth out the sound a little bit. And it also helps it stand out in the mix. Uh, the final guitar track comes in at, oh, comes in at the end here again. More of the preamp emulation. Uh, that goes into an EQ, rolling off the low and highs again. Uh, and into the compressor. And then what's different about this guitar track in particular is uh, the delay. This is the nasty DLA. Uh, and it's, set, it, it's the epic preset, where is that? Uh, there, there's an epic preset in there and I felt it worked really really well it's kind of subtle in the mix but it blends with the guitar so well
and helps to widen out the stereo image quite a bit. Um, otherwise, the guitar would be very dead center. It helps with the ambience, especially during that sample. Um, it helps everything fit together, which is something that is not n normal for a delay, but it works out really well. So that's how the guitars are mixed. And there is actually a little bit of a change here at the end. That's pretty harsh, but it's not as harsh as that other uh, guitar track, so I, I left it mostly as is. And I, I do like the delay or yeah, the delay tail off the end. It's quite nice. Uh, let's move on to the Vox because there's so. One thing you'll notice in a lot of my mixes is actually how similar most of the tracks are. The only thing I really change up is like what compressor I'm using for different uh, for different applications. Um, the settings vary somewhat between each track, uh, but really I, I throw the, most of the effects on there on each individual track instead of putting all those effects on a bus. I want the compressors and I want the EQs to act as they or act independent of all the other ones. If I just throw one master compressor on there, it's going to be compressing everything equally. I want each track to have some unique compression about it. But I find that I, I do like this one vocal style, and I keep reaching back for it. So real quick, we'll go over uh, Kale's main track here. Even in our shady days, we had nasty ways to paraphrase dick and dick and mayonnaise. Uh, what's different about this is I'm actually using uh, left right. Um, so I have Even in our his main vocal centered, but when his secondary vocal comes in, I'm panning it. Days we had nasty ways to paraphrase dick and dick and mayonnaise. And that widens everything out and adds emphasis to those specific parts. And then when he goes in just starts rapping uh they're they're stereo separated all the booty bouncing ass hanging grooves were dropping high. to get the so when he's just rapping a, a, in a single channel it kind of loses its emphasis in some cases even in our shady days we had nasty so to get around this i uh, linked the stereo separation automation to an EQ, which emphasizes the high end and boosts the volume just a bit. Uh, and this makes the single vocal stand out as a pair, as opposed to the dual track. Adding another track is just going to make everything louder, so I needed to make sure the one track was loud enough so it didn't get just blocked by the, the dual track. Um, so that's why uh, the single track is much louder than the, than the dual track. Um, from there, I'm using pretty much the same effects on both channels, uh, the same preamp emulation on modern mode, uh, with the, with the drive turned way up Days we had nasty ways to paraphrase dick and dick and mayonnaise and EQ to roll off on the low end. Kale's voice goes a bit lower than Joey's. So you'll, you'll find out a cut lower than, um, lower than Joey's vocals. Days we had nasty ways to paraphrase. And then that goes into Thrill Seeker LA. And because this is a rap, a more of a rap, I'm trying to avoid most of the distortion. I, I have some saturation from the preamp, but it's very light. Um, and I'm not adding any later on in the chain. So I'll go ahead and uh, mute on and off the uh, the effects so you can hear what that sounds like. Even in our shady days, had na even in our shady days, we had nasty ways to paraphrase dick and dick and mayonnaise. Even in our shady days, we even in our shady days. And the thr the thrill seeker compressor makes the biggest difference because it's uh, attenuating the gain on it. It's making it a fair bit louder already. So we're we're boosting and then automating a volume even after that. And that's the same for both of them. If I toggle the effects here. Even in our shady days, we had nasty ways to paraphrase dick and dick and mayonnaise. Even in our shady days, as you can hear, the the single. And the single track really just kind of fades if you uh, don't do anything to it. Um, so that's why I added the EQ. Bring the effects back. 
Even in our shady days, we had nasty ways to paraphrase dick and dick and mayonnaise. All the booty bouncing ass hanging grooves were dropping. Even in and I am, of course, eat, or adding some reverb, but we'll get to that in a moment. So that's Kale's vocal. And then I have Joey's vocal over here. And he is just hard panned uh, the whole track. I was going to automate the panning on and off, but then I realized it's he's pretty much singing the, the same thing twice the whole way through. So I just left it hard or left it panned, left it panned the whole way through. Richer than Kimmy West, chest dipped in chocolate. Oh, cut the check. I was paid to say that. Richer than OK, so first we're using the EQ emulation with the drive turned up, of course, EQ. Uh, slightly higher Richer than Kimmy West, just dipped in. and VBL in this case this, since this is the main vocal I crushed it a little bit more not a whole lot more but I felt the limiter was more appropriate in this case uh, really it was just a, a sound difference that I felt like should be on the main vocal and it's on both of them of course and they're largely the same so I'll let you hear what the difference is between the two tracks just dipped in chocolate oh cut the check i was paid to say that welcome ads made of fat stacks and autographs i wipe my muddy feet and sneeze into a wad of g's richer than kimmy west just dipped in chocolate oh cut the check i was paid to say it's uh, kind of a subtle it's just a little bit louder overall and that comes from the compressor that helps it uh, helps out a lot when you get to the mixing stage having everything basically normalized to zero to some extent um, and that that's straight through most of the track. And then I have uh, Joey backing. Let me see. Now, what you think he tips if I wash his car? I say, oh my God, I got So this is the low and high vocal. Zillionaire, what you think he tips if I wash his car? I say, oh my God, I got Zillionaire. And that has more emphasis on the low end, 100 to 300 hertz. Uh, there didn't need to be a lot more going on in the lower, mid, and mid, mid, I guess you could say. Um, we already have Joey's main vocals filling out that range, so I placed more emphasis on the low vocal in the low range, of course. And same goes for the high vocal. Just a bit of boost in the high end, and it cut through the mix quite well. And both of those go into uh, Thrill Seeker LA. Can't get enough of that plugin. Really can't. What you think he tips if I wash his car? I say, oh my god, I got Zillionaire. Hope I get hit by a solid gold whip. So when you layer that in with the rest of the vocals. What you think he tips if I wash his car? I say, oh my god, I got So that works out pretty well. You can hear most of the tracks fairly well. You get they're separated in the mix. Uh, which is really, really good for having four tracks. Uh, what else do we got? There's a couple of other things. Backing vocals. Where did I put those? Oh, there's only one sample in both of these. Pirates. <laughs> pirates. Can't get enough pirates. And I left those untouched. Pi I probably should have put some EQ on there, but Pi it doesn't matter. Pirates. Pirates. There we go. Pirates. All right, let's move on to. Oh yeah, before we leave here, uh, Epic Verb, the vocal reverb plugin I use. I'm using a Hall-based reverb at 1,300 milliseconds, and rolling off the low end and some of the mid-range. Uh, uh, when I when I approach mixing, I try to avoid having too much going on in the mids. You'll find that the mids get filled up with guitar and vocals and even some of the drum kit. So you really want to avoid cramming more stuff in there. So whenever I EQ something, I'm probably going to be dropping down the mid a little bit more, uh, especially when it comes to effects. And I do the same thing on the drum bus as well. Um, low mids emphasized around the snare, but then some of the mids dropped off just a little bit and then boosted in the high end. Uh, this allows the reverb to punch through the mix, especially in the high end, but not get or not, not muddle everything up. So that's why I do that. Uh, real quick, we'll go over the samples. 
Not much going on there, but there is a little bit, so we'll go over that real quick. Where are those? Here they are. Whoops. So this sample is pretty lo-fi. Really lo-fi. So I used EQ to sort of help bring a little bit of it back. Bring some of the clarity back. Um, you'll find that this is actually how old breakbeats are done. Uh, you'll you'll get like a single room mic for a drum kit, and then they'll EQ it in such a way that it brings out a lot of the detail back. And that works out pretty well. I'm automating the, the volume a little bit right here. Very mid-present without the EQ. That goes into Thrill Seeker LA. Just to level it out a little bit. It's fairly dynamic. And then I am automating the uh, Valhalla Shimmer Reverb here. You'll hear that come in. Since that sample cuts off rather abruptly, I put that reverb on there. And I think it levels out, or smooths everything out and adds a cool ambience to the track because this is where the uh, the wobbly guitars come in. And then the other sample comes in. Cannot have enough milkshake. Fairly heavy on the EQ. Just where I thought it needed it to preserve some of the clarity and not have it rumble so much. I was same as the other uh, sample, it was very mid-heavy. And that also helps to clamp down on a little bit of the natural reverb that's in that sound. I, I drink your milkshake. It uh, cuts back on that a little bit, which is nice, especially since we're bringing it back with the compressor. Uh, more of the compressor with the distortion turned on. And then I'm actually using a limiter. I drink your milkshake. Just to remove those couple of little transients that I popped through and I felt didn't belong in the mix. That was added a fair bit after I had already already thrown the EQ and compression on there. Now the fun part, the drums, because I do a lot of different stuff for the different uh, elements here. So we'll get into that. And then I'll go over final mixing, which would be the the, the buses and then uh, the, uh, the master channel. So real quick, we'll go over the drums. Lots of drum tracks. Got plenty of those, all of these. All right, so let's get into the kick because the kick is probably one of the most important elements in this track. Turn off the reverb for now. So we have two uh, two kicks, and they were recorded on the same kick drum, of course. Uh, we have the inside and outside channel, and this actually gave me a lot of flexibility when creating the tone. Uh, it ended up being a huge benefit. Rather than having to EQ and compress one kick sound just to get it perfect, I have two to work with and I can blend them together. So the first one we have is a very clicky, uh, clicky track. And I'm actually gating it. I have just a simple Maximus on here with a threshold set like that. And that gates it. It doesn't need a lot of gating and the recording is fairly good, but having a gate, especially on the kick drum, can be pretty important. Um, that You'll see that more in metal, but I think it worked out pretty pretty well here. From there, I'm EQing it like crazy and dropping off a lot of the mid-range, but bringing back a lot of that 2K, the click. It gets the thump in the low end and then the, the snap of the kick. And I'm doing basically the opposite on the second track. That makes it so I can use the faders to adjust the mid presence of the kick. If I were to just have this kick, the clicky one in there, it sounds sort of like it's tuned for uh, double bass or metal. Um, that goes into saturation, lots of saturation, and then into the compressor. 
pretty straightforward. Pretty normal chain for me. And then the second one is the same thing, almost. Uh, same gate uh, EQ, but much, much, much more presence in the in the mid-range. A little bit of the kick was cut off there, but I don't think that matters too, too much. I, I prefer the snappier mid kick. And it helps cut down on some of the hi-hat bleed. Then it goes into uh, saturation again and compressor. And that tone works out pretty well, especially in the mix. So we'll get both of these together. So we get a nice click with a nice mid punch. Cool. So that's how the kick was done. Next, we're going to move on to the snare. I had some fun with the with the snare. Where where is that track? It's down here, somewhere. Snare top. They're, they're moved around a little bit. All right, snare bottom is here too. So we'll move on to that. And the snare is done in pretty much the same way, actually. Uh, gate, uh, EQ, and in this case, emphasis on the the mids around two hundred and the high end. And this is. Since this is for the, the bottom, we're getting a lot more of the snare shaker, or it's the, the springs on the bottom of the snare. We're getting a lot, lot more of that. So I wanted to emphasize that in the high end. Saturation and compression. And then we're also using, uh, we're using the second channel much, much more heavily for the 200 range. So fairly significant boost there. But you, as you can hear, there's that snap in there, the, the thud of the of the snare is right there in that 200 hertz range. So I really wanted to emphasize that and throw that into the saturation versus a bunch of high end. Since especially since we have high end already from the first track, and then that gets compressed as well. Then turn off the effects. So as you can hear, there's a huge difference. There's a much more of a crack to the snare. And I I just love a, a snare that really like punches you in the face. Uh, it, I guess that's how you would say that. Um, I want it to, to ring out, but not have the, the resonance that a lot of snares tend to have, especially in acoustic recordings. You can hear it there a little bit, but most of the resonance is taken out. And I can, of course, do the same if I needed m more of the high end or more of the low end, I can uh, adjust these. But I have felt that they were fairly balanced as they came out of the compressor, so left it as is. Uh, next, we have the overheads, which I, I have fun with the overheads. There's a lot we can do with the overheads to get an interesting tone. And since the overheads really determine how your drums sound overall, it you can have a lot of you can do a lot with them and have a lot of fun. So. Of course, we're using the uh, preamp emulation, but when it comes to EQing them, I emphasize the mid-range. Uh, a drum kit is a lot of kick and a lot of snare and a lot of hi-hat, especially in this kit. Emphasizing the mid-range can help out a little bit to help it stand out in the mix. I know I said earlier that I try to avoid doing that with mid-ranges, but there's already not a lot of mids going on in this kit, so boosting them a little bit is more or less okay. Uh, then where I get the bulk of the tone from is Thrill Seeker VBL. This is that same limiter that I was using earlier, and I it just works fantastic on overhead mics. Having a overdone, overcompressed overhead mic helps it stand out in the mix way better, and you're not really going to notice that it's overcompressed, especially when you have the huge dynamics of the kick and snare. So we'll play that through real quick. And of course, we do get more kick and snare sound out of the overheads. They're drawn back fairly far, but if we bring in the, the kick and snare. You 
you can kind of hear we get some hi hi hat in there without the effects on. But when we bring in the effects, we get much more room sound and much more of a consistent sound. And that works out great. And of course, I have them panned left, right. Um, this just helps with the room sound. We, we want some sort of stereo image, especially since the kick and snare are just straight pan center. Um, we don't want the snare or kick or whatever to be off in the distance. We want it front row center. We want that in your head banging away. Uh, but we don't need that for the rest of everything else. Uh, when it comes to the toms, uh, there's just so much resonance in the rack and floor toms, and there's not really a lot going on in them. Uh, it's, it's just a lot of room, a lot of hi-hat. There is something there, so I did leave it there. But so much resonance, and it was so hard to get rid of that I really just tried to make it uh, more of an ambient sound something that adds to the drum kit without just destroying the sound. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of uh, EQ and effects here. First one is to remove some of the resonant frequencies in the low end. Um, you can see that there's a lot of resonance going on here and this frequency in particular right at 137 hertz was just overbearing in my opinion. So I backed that off. And I tried to bring down some of the hi-hat, but you can hear that it's still very present. Uh, that goes into Tesla for some saturation. Give it a little bit more of a crack. Uh, I like a tom that is, it's a snap like a cannon going off. And I tried to get get that sound, but there's just a lot of resonance. There's just not a lot you can do. That goes into more EQ. And this was after I had done most of everything. Uh, but this is just what I felt it needed at the end and then compression and a lot of it uh, again this contributes to the to this drum kit sound so lots of compression no big deal especially if it's that quiet and that goes for for both of them so if we add all these together you can hear that the kit sounds like muted if they're not in there but but bring it back in and all of a sudden you got more a, a better sound that more acoustic sound so they're not completely evil but they're far back. And then of course we have the final channel for reverb. Uh, I'm using hall reverb. Normally I would use uh, room reverb, especially on drums, but hall worked, worked out pretty well here. And I have the mid side turned up as well. And that, then I'm EQing, rolling off some of the low end. I don't like a lot of kick in my reverb. It gets really muddy real quick. So we'll, we'll avoid that. Oops, bring that back. I don't need that. I keep forgetting where the playlist button is. So if we add all that together, that's how I got the drum sound. Pretty good. Uh, so now we're going to move on to the next part of the mixing, the buses. Let's just start with the drum bus. We're already here. Most of the time I'm doing the exact same thing on a lot of the buses. Um, Backstreet Q and Density Mark III. Uh, these are just fantastic when it comes to bus mixing. Uh, they're uh, the Maxter EQ is a more more of a light touch. Uh, just get in there, shove shove a couple frequencies off, and get the sound you really want. Um, and then density is just a smooth compressor straight through and through. It's, in my opinion, fairly transparent, uh, but it has a nice tone to it. So nice tone. I, I don't really know how to describe it. I shouldn't use words like just tone. Uh, I cut at 36 hertz. I don't feel like the kick should go beneath that. Uh, we're not dealing with a lot of subsonic frequencies, so cut at 36 hertz, um, and then I shelve at 116 and boost about two decibels. So just a little bit of extra thump in the low end, especially with the with the kick, it just helps round everything out. Um, I'm backing off just a, just a hair above 7.1. I didn't need much, but the hi hats were just a little bit overbearing. Uh, cut at 21 kilohertz. Uh, shouldn't really need anything above 21 on a drum kit. Shouldn't really need much above 21 anyways. Um, then we go into density, where I have the range set right about 8 decibels, so it won't go far beyond 8. Most of the time it won't. 
uh, drive turned up some. The timing turned down. I wanted uh, a lot of snap in the in the drums, so I turned down the timing. Normally, if I was mastering, I wouldn't have it that low. Um, and then I'm mastering left, right, independently. Uh, so the uh, top is, I think that's right, and the bottom left uh, to help preserve the the stereo image in the overheads. Pretty cool. And that's all I'm doing on the drum bus. And I do not have the reverb routed through the drum bus. I don't need I don't need extra compression on the reverb. That's going to get muddy real quick. Uh, next we have the Vox bus. Same Baxter EQ. Bring in these vocal channels. And then density. And largely the same setup, except I'm using the stereo in this time. And I have the range set to a maximum of four. Lower drive, I didn't need as much compression on the vocals. Let's find some vocals real quick. Got a god zillionaire, Julianaire. What you think he tips if I wash his car? I say, oh my god, a god zillionaire, Julianaire. Hope I get hit by a solid gold whip. Like I said, density can be very transparent. Got a god Especially if you hit it with only like four decibels of compression, it's gonna not be much of anything at all. But it just works. It smooths everything out and makes it so you don't have to do as much volume automation. I try to avoid doing volume automation because uh, that's just kind of messing with how the vocals were performed. Uh, but you can certainly do uh, do a lot with that. Um, and then Baxter's uh, so sort of the same, except I cut at 43 hertz and boost at 230. Uh, since there's not much below like 100 hertz in the vocals, uh, boosted 230 can add a little bit of oomph to the vocals, a little bit of uh, force to prevent them from being overly thin. Wow, I'm using a lot of by words. It helps the vocals stand out in the mix and not just sound overly high. And that certainly helps with the with the lower vocal. Cool. So that's how the vocals were done. Next we have guitars. Same Baxter EQ, different settings. You can look at them if you want. Uh, and density. And since that's a very plucky sound. Uh, it was kind of important to have more compression. And I did turn down the timings to, to help help with that. But when it came to the final master, that it didn't come, come down to be an issue. So, mastering. Ooh, what fun. Uh, real quick, the vinyl emulation that I talked about earlier uh, only comes in at one part of the track right here during the sample. And that's what's contributing to some of the distortion. I would call it distortion, not just saturation at that point. Uh, uh, this is the Isotope Vinyl plugin. And I'm using a light touch on the first three faders for mechanical noise, wear, and electric noise. Really light touch. Um, as you can hear, it severely drops off the high end. Uh, that's what a record would normally do. You won't have that much high end or detail in a record. Even if I have it set to a more recent record setting at a high RPM to preserve some of the detail, it's really, really not much in the high end. And that stays on there until the end here. And you can hear that first snare when it cuts off. It's a nice high-end crack that lets you know that you're back in into the track. And that's part of why I did it. Having uh, an interesting effect during the, the sampled section, it's not quite the chorus, it's more of a bridge, I guess. Um, having that in there, removing some of the high-end, makes it much more forceful when it comes back in. And that comes down to more of a writing thing 
but I felt it fit fairly well, so that's why that's there. On the mastering, nope. Backstreet EQ, cut below 36, and I do have something interesting here. I have mid side turned on. So we have the top, which is the mids, and the bottom, which is the low, or not the, not the lows, uh, mids versus sides. So anything that's uh, different on the left, right will be adjusted by the bottom. So I add more low end on the bottom, or in the, in the mids. Mid, mids now means something different. In the mid channel, I'm adding more low end to make the thump of the kick resonate more in your head rather than having it way off in the middle of nowhere. And then I'm dropping off the severe highs out of the center channel and then letting the sides pick that up and inverse for the, for the low end base. Uh, so this draws some of the low end out of the sides out of your stereo image and push it back towards the middle while bringing out the highs and the greater clarity into the, into the sides. It's not a super strong effect, but it works out really well. And I've used this EQ on just about everything now because it makes the stereo image just that much better. So I'll, I'll play a track with and without it real quick. Not a lot but just that little bit they could make your mix go from, wow, this is pretty good, to, oh, wow, that's really good. Uh, next, density. Wasn't expecting that. Uh, this is also in mid-side mode, so we get the top is the mids, and then the bottom is the sides. So I can compress them independently, which basically just gives me a knob here at the end to adjust how much stereo I want. And, that, and that's fantastic. Um, so you can see I have the mids, in the mid section or mid channel turned up some, but then a little bit of extra on the sides, and I'll play with and without that. I feel like it's most obvious on the kick and snare. It really helps level them out and make them blend with everything else. It makes them still punch, but just not quite as much. And since they're turned up quite loud, a little bit less was just right. Uh, EQ, shelving, or not shelving, cutting out anything below uh, 25 hertz. Pretty simple. Boost in the 1 to 2K range a little bit, like really just a, a dB or two, just to emphasize that. And that's where most of the vocals sit, so just a little bit of emphasis there. And then it goes into a Maximus, which is set up like so. And that serves mostly just a leveling purpose. It levels out the low mids and highs so they work well together and one's not overpowering the other. And it, it's fairly heavy on the compression. If we look here, I can pull up the limiter uh, for the track. We can see it's working some. I try to avoid having the limiter work too hard. Uh, I, I don't like an over limited sound, but if we look here, bring back the Maximus, I'll play with and without so you can get an idea of how much the Maximus is actually doing. So you can see it's actually doing quite a bit. Um, I'm not. I hope I'm not over compressing when it comes to the to the limiting. Uh, I backed it off. Uh, backed off on the release a little bit to make sure it didn't sound over compressed. It doesn't sound too bad to my ears, and I prefer to have it on there to make sure it's not clipping. Um, so yeah, that that's basically everything when it came to this track. Um, that's going to be clipped. I just looked at the meter for that. I hope that didn't just like crunch everything. 
The mastering basically leveled everything out, made it brighter, more clear, and more awesome. That is how I mixed and mastered this track. Hopefully you made it the whole way through. Thanks for watching. My name is Zator. I'll catch you in the next video.